very warm welcome to Westminster Business School and a particular welcome to James and uh, the family, all his family. We're delighted to be here yet again for the fourth occasion that we have run the um, annual All of Goths lecture and we're delighted to have so many of you here today and some uh, distinguished speakers. So I'd like to say a few words about Orla to, uh, as context and a reminder and then I will introduce our speakers um, and say a few words as well about the about the business school. The plan is about 15 minute introduction and we have our two speakers uh, followed by a Q&A which will be led by our distinguished Professor Harry Thapper, uh, Professor of Finance here at the Business School. Uh, he'll ask lots of difficult questions, I'm sure. And um, he'll host the Q&A and then we will move into Chilton Hall on the other side of the corridor at around eight. So those, that's the sequence of events. So uh, my name is Malcolm Kirkup. I'm head of the Business School and also Pro Vice Chancellor for People and Culture. Uh, in the university as a whole, which is an interesting combination of, of jobs. Um, this, as I've said, is our fourth occasion, our fourth opportunity to host the uh, annual Orla Goth Lecture, organised in memory of one of the finest professors we've had at the, the university. Orla was born in Dublin, June 1954. She gained a first class honours degree in English from the University College of Dublin in 1978. Orla joined the University of Westminster as a lecturer in 1988. She completed her doctorate from City University London. Gifted in business and excelling with leadership potential, she was promoted as the head of Department of Finance and Business Law in 1997. And she held this post in the renamed Department of Accounting, Finance and Governance until her passing at the age of 60. Under her inspirational leadership, the department continued to grow in confidence and stature. She cared deeply about her staff, about student learning and about students' achievements. Orla was strongly committed to women's and ethnic minority rights. Her personal values of diversity and inclusivity were reflect, reflected in her prolific research record. And Orla would have been delighted to have learned uh, last year that the, the university has been ranked second in the UK out of 120 universities for boosting social mobility. The report was published by the Institute for Fiscal Studies in partnership with the Department for Education. And the analysis compares how many pupils from low income backgrounds uh, or who were on free school meals in the mid 2000s made it into the top 20% of earners by the age of 30. The IFS tracked students who graduated at the time Orla was here and this is a wonderful achievement for the university and is a credit to all those including Orla who championed university education for disadvantaged groups. As a researcher, Orla published over 100 articles and became an esteemed expert on pensions policy. For her contributions to research on pensions, in 2009, she was awarded the title of Professor of Pensions and Financial Services. She had a unique gift for bringing academics and public and business professionals together in her research. Orla would also have been very proud of the achievements the School of Finance and Accounting has continued to achieve. It's one of our most successful schools in the university. It continues to deliver an impressive student experience and constantly expanding year on year. And we've continued a tradition that Orla started, which is to secure recognition from all of the professional uh, bodies in finance and accounting and exemptions from many of the professional exams. Our programmes are supported by SEMA, ACCA, CBA, CFA, and we're a CIFI Centre for Excellence. The School of Accounting and Finance continues to innovate, and we have had particular success in the last two years with the launch of our Masters in uh, FinTech, and we have the course leader here with us tonight. Anne, where are you? 
Um, and it is a fabulous program and growing rapidly and achieving particular success in terms of employability. In September next year, we launch our first undergraduate degree in FinTech, uh, FinTech and Business Analytics, and we expect to see the same uh, success there. The other major development, which I'm sure all are, would have been proud of, is that we have uh, a building next door at 29 Marylebone Road. Um, you, will, you can't miss it if you come from central London out this way. It, a 10 floor block, which we have owned since 2014, but we have finally raised the capital and uh, developed a fantastic vision for a new enterprise for enter center for enterprise and employability, focusing particularly on inclusivity, uh, breaking down the barriers to allow uh, all groups, everyone uh, who studies at the university and also in the local community, to access a center and facilities for the development of enterprise skills, uh, digital skills training. Um, uh, um, we have a student incubation centre, we will have a maker centre, prototype digital uh, maker centre, and it's an opportunity following Westminster's tradition of widening participation to set up an enterprise centre that's inclusive and open to everyone. So that's a major uh, development. Uh, we're just in the final throes of the last bit of planning permission, and then we uh, will start to uh, refurbish the building uh, very soon. It's due to open in the spring of 24, I'm looking at Jordan uh, to check, and uh, that would be a major achievement for Westminster, something we're, we're very proud of, and I'm sure Orla would be too. In honour of Orla and her many contributions to the business school, we launched this annual Orla Goff lecture. The first was delivered by Baroness Ross Altman, the second, by Kip Meek, the third by Sherry uh, Madeira, and today, tonight, we are delighted to welcome Suzanne Christie and Devi Mohan to give us the a joint annual Orlegoff lecture. Suzanne is an award-winning CEO of FinTech Circle, Europe's first investor network focused on FinTech investments and a leading FinTech innovation, learning and communications platform. She is a, an, a FTSE board member. She is also co-editor of the bestseller, The FinTech Book, which has been translated into 10 languages and is sold across 107 countries. She's been a FinTech TV commentator on ITN and CNBC and a guest lecturer on FinTech at the University of Cambridge and Warwick. After completing her MBA, she started her career working for a FinTech company before the term fintech was invented. Um, and she worked in, in fintech um, as long ago as 25 years, hard to believe. Um, she then worked for more than 15 years across Deutsche Bank, Lloyds Banking Group, Morgan Stanley, and Accenture in London and Hong Kong. Devi, Devi Mohan is an influential writer, speaker, and commentator on fintech has been listed as a top 10 global fintech influencer by several groups. Devi is the co-founder and CEO of Burnmark, a fintech research company that supplies research and data to players of the fintech ecosystem. Uh, Devi has helped several banks, fintech startups, innovation groups and investors understand trends in the fintech industry, helping them set their corporate marketing and investment strategies. And she's also a proponent of a fintech ecosystem where banks and startups collaborate to drive innovation. So we're delighted to welcome you. Thank you for, for coming and for joining us on this special occasion. So welcome, I will introduce Susan. Will you be lead us off? Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and I hand, go over to the microphones now. And uh, welcome to all of you today. I'm very excited to be here and, uh, and to be able to talk about fintech, which is my favorite subject. And so I will talk about the future of fintech and global investment trends. 
and give you lots of examples from my experience in practice. And I also want to definitely tell you all it's the right thing if you study fintech here, because fintech is the world, it's a future finance, in fact. So if you know about fintech, there's so many jobs out there, there's so many opportunities out there for you, because it's about really the future. In any, I mean, I am on the board of the bank, I was on the board meeting this afternoon, you know, and our board members don't understand enough about fintech, you know, so you literally, the, the chances are limitless. From the beginning, you know, when you start your career to becoming a board member, everybody needs fintech expertise uh, nowadays. So if I go to the next slide here, um, as I mentioned, um, I launched fintech circuit in 2014, and I worked, you know, before at Accenture, at Morgan Stanley, at Lloyds Bank, and at Deutsche Bank, and I moved initially from Austria. So I came from Vienna and I came to London about 25 years ago and, uh, and, and moved into financial services. But before I actually moved to Accenture, I started, I studied in Berkeley, you know, I was doing my MBA in Berkeley and I uh, worked for and learned, worked for a technology company there and then at Accenture learned to code. You know, so I started to actually get to thinking from the technology side, learning to code C++ which is a computer language. And then after learning the technology side, moving to Accenture, you know, in system integration, then after two years, I said, I want to move to the business side. So I moved to Morgan Stanley. And at that time, you know, FinTech was not a term yet. So I was so happy when FinTech became a term, because all of a sudden my life made sense. You know, all of a sudden everything linked together. And it was a good thing to have technology skills and business skills, because that's what FinTech is all about. And I'm also a non-executive director at CMC Markets, which is a FTSE 250 company, uh, which is, uh, as you know, maybe you know Lord Peter Bruders, you know, he is the majority shareholder, and he very much believes in uh, social mobility as well. You know, he, uh, you might know, uh, read his book, you know, his book is Passport to Success. So he said in his book, his story about growing up in the city where his mother was a cleaning lady in the city of London. And he helped his mother, you know, doing cleaning jobs in banks in the city of London. And now he's a multi, multi-millionaire, you know, one of the richest people in the UK, in fact, and being, you know, the maturity owner of the company, which is about 700 million in valuation. So that's a story, you know, in terms of social mobility, which is which is incredibly inspiring. And I'm also on the board of Crown Agents Bank. Again, Crown Agents Bank is a very interesting company because we, the, the reason why the bank is called Crown, as you can imagine, it links back to our royal family and to the commonwealth countries. So what Crown Agents Bank does, it sends money to the former colonies. It sends money to emerging market countries and does wholesale FX. So wholesale foreign exchange payments to all emerging market countries. And our customers are central banks in Senegal, you know, in, in Nairobi, uh, in, in South Africa. And we send currencies, you know, from sterling, we convert it into local African currencies across Asia, Spain, Latin America, and we, we allow United Nations to send money there, for example, you know, or, or save the children, so global NGOs, global central banks. And the book series, you've got it here, so if you want to dig deeper and learn about FinTech, these are the books, you know, I, I co-author and the co-editor for, and which I can recommend you uh, because, because they are a great way of getting into the details and the starting book is called the fintech book that's the first one we published five years ago and then we moved into insurance the insure tech book into asset management it's a wealth tech book and then two years ago we focused on payments pay tech and then the ai book and the latest one was legal tech because as you see technology aspects also impact the legal sector and among the legal sector this area is called access to law and access for all. And very few people can afford lawyers, you know, because lawyers is very expensive. So ex legal tech allows access to, uh, for everybody to get legal services, legal access to legal rights. 
And another very good one is which we launched a year ago is called Fintech for Dummies. So you might know the dummy series and all books are published by Wiley. And after having done those six books, Wiley approached me and said, do you want to write a book for us on Fintech for Dummies? And this book, although it's called for Dummies, actually is very sophisticated, you know? So within a few chapters, you become an expert. And, uh, and he goes, he talks about, you know, both the technology side, the ecosystems, investing, it really covers everything. So these are great tools, you know, if you want to go deeper. So I want to talk about five key trends today. And these are five trends which really change literally all of our lives, if we, if we want it or not. But they are positive, luckily, the positive trends. So the first one is about analog to digital. You know, when you think about banks in the past, in the past, when you think about my mother in Austria, you know, if she wanted to open up a bank account, she had to go to her bank in, in, in Vienna, you know, with a form signed in hard copy, hand it over to the bank, you know, and, and open up a bank account. So everything was analog. Today it's digital. You know, when you open up a bank account today, you can do this online on your mobile phone, taking a selfie. You might have to rotate your face to make sure that you're alive. You know, this is biometric client onboarding tests. And you can do this online within five minutes, you know, from the comfort of your sofa in your living room. So that's a huge trend because we consumers, you know, we do much more on the go. I mean, we do banking by the wait on a bus stop. For the next bus to come you know we are we are just much more integrating our, our digital lives because we can we can do that and in the past you know banks were valued by how many branches they've got but now that doesn't matter anymore because now our phone is our branch you know very few people go to the branches anymore we use our phone as our branch nowadays the second one is discreet to embed you know, again, when we look at the past, and we're still in this process, products have been discrete products. So you had a discrete savings account, you know, you had a current account, you had a mortgage, you had a loan, different products, all individual products next to each other. What we see now is the products become more embedded. So they have become part of the customer journey. So when in the future, when you buy a flat, for example, you know, and you know that you need to get a mortgage, you need to get insurance, you need to get lots of things to buy a flat. All those things will happen in the background for you. So you just go to the real estate agent, you just choose the flat you want to purchase, and then they will automatically will get offered, you know, which mortgages would apply for you, which insurance policies would be relevant. So all this will be embedded, will be easier, for you to choose and pick what's right for you, but it will remove the long search process, which we currently have got, you know, the complexity of financial services often. So this is discrete to embed it. The next one is centralized to decentralized. That's the latest trend, which just started a few years ago. And what I mean by that is that currently our world in financial services is very centralized. You know, we have got a stock exchange, like London Stock Exchange, and buyers and sellers come together and buy and sell securities on the London Stock Exchange. Or we have got, you know, the Bank of England as a central bank uh, for the UK. So financial services has been centralized, and the centralized uh, entity was relevant for trust, because we had to have somebody who we can trust and who treats both sides fairly you know, in order to ensure that our trading is done fairly. But what we see now is we see the move towards a decentralized economy. And decentralized means that people say, well, I can trust. And if I know I want to, I want to be able to send money directly to you without a centralized entity in between. And the reason why people want to do that is because they say, I want to make sure that you get all the money. You know, so an example, if I would send money today to Nairobi, you know, and I want to send 100 pounds, you know, based on the various middlemen and the correspondent banks, maybe 85 pounds would arrive you know, in Nairobi. It's a 15, 50% cut, you know, in terms of, of transfer payments. If you use fintech solution companies like TransferWise, you know, or other remittance companies, you can reduce this 
tax in the middle or this cut in the middle significantly to less than 5% normally. And that's very important because there's a sentence which says it's very expensive to be poor. And it's very expensive to be poor because if you are poor and you don't know where to go, you overpay for services which you can least afford because you want all, if you remit money back home, you know, then you would like all the money, at least the, the, the most money to get back home. And you don't want to get so much paid out to the intermediaries. So this is a huge trend towards decentralized money. The next one is interesting. It's about cash. You know, we all know cash. Cash is still being used, of course, a lot, but it moves towards programmable money. And what programmable money, what this means is that the new forms of money are the ones which you can define how they should work. So an example would be, you could define cash and say, but this cash expires in three months time. So it is a currency, but it expires in three months time. And so you could use it for stimulating the economy, you know, or sending it for, to refugees. But you want them to spend the money now because they get another payment in three months time. So you want to help now. So you can, nowadays you can put conditions on cash. How can it be used for? This is called programmable money. Or you could say, I send you money, but the programmable part should be, I don't want you to use it for gambling. You know, I want you to use it for your children's education, or for food, for drinks, or for, but not for gambling. So you can exclude that as an option, you know. So this is the future of cash is programmable money. And that's why we have got lots of institutions piloting the future of money. You know, we've got even the Bank of England, they are working on so-called central bank digital currencies, C CBDCs, where they think how can they launch a digital pound, you know, a digital programmable money in fact. And we've got lots of private sector organizations who do the same thing. So there's, and the opportunities are, are enormous. And the interesting thing is, you know, when you think, and that's, that's why the power of students is so important, of experts, is so important because when you think back to Ford, you know, when he invented the car, he was later asked, how did you come up with this idea of the car? Did you ask your customers? Then he said, if I would have asked all my customers, they would have told me we want faster horses. Because this was the competition, they had horses at the time. And so they want faster horses. Nobody had the idea of a car. You know, so it's kind of thinking two steps ahead of the game. And that's what we need to do now in finance. We need to think about what can we do with these new technologies? You know, what can we create when it's not here before? And that's hard because we go on untrodden paths, you know, we're going to new ways which never, nobody else has ever walked on before. And that's why it's exciting as well, you know, because we can really shape the future. And the last one is about ESG, green fintech with purpose. So all, we all know how important ESG is, and we, and we call fintech companies to focus on ESG, you know, environment, social governance of the green fintech or green finance companies. And that's another a, a big, big trend which we are seeing. Here I wanted to give you a few examples of embedded finance. I mean, the first one you all know, Uber. It's the best example, you know, easy to understand for your own. We get out of the taxi, we don't pay but we actually have paid. So that's the best example. Uh, we've got lots of other examples. We've got embedded payments, embedded lending, embedded insurance, embedded banking. So where you see really these examples, you can, uh, you know, I can share the slide deck afterwards with all students here as well. So you can literally go to the website and check out those companies and try to understand how they work. You know, what do they offer? How do they make money? What's their business model? What's their financial model? And you will learn a lot because you will can understand, you know, why those companies exist and what do they offer in terms of embedding financial solutions in the normal life cycle of our lives. Because normally, you know, we don't, when we, when we going back to the mortgage example, if we, we never want to buy a mortgage. I mean, nobody wants to buy a mortgage. You know, we want to buy a house, we want to buy a property. But the mortgage is like the thing we have to do in order to do it. You know, so it's kind of the, you know, conditioner, conditioner, sine qua non, for Latin speakers. 
Uh, but it's something which uh, that's this that's why we can embed those things because it is not the ultimate goal. So I want to give you a case study now. So what you see in this picture is a Tesla car. And I give you this case study in the sense of imagine that Tesla is one of the biggest companies in the world. They can create their own money. Could be the Tesla coin. You know, so how this would work is that Tesla would create their own digital currency and they could peg it against any currency they choose. So if they want to create a so-called stable coin, you know, a stable coin is a coin which is pegged to another currency. So it could be pegged to the US dollar. So one Tesla coin could mean one US dollar. And then Tesla could say, well, we put this wallet into our car. So every Tesla owner has got a digital wallet. And you have got, when you buy the Tesla, you get you know, $50 of stable coins. And you can buy whatever you want. You know, with this money, you can convert it into a fiat currency. So our mobile pound is called fiat currency. You know, cryptocurrencies are non-fiat currencies. And so you can use this um, this, uh, this this wallet, you know, to make payments. And then what you, you could add, you know, interesting things. So you could say, well, you've got an option to communicate with other Tesla owners and their digital wallets, or even with other cars. You know, you might say, well, our digital wallet in our car can communicate with the BMWs, and the Mercedes-Benz, and the Audis. You know, we can communicate across cars. And there would be the opportunity to say, well, we can, if we need to drive a certain highway, I am willing to pay other drivers if they let me, let me pass and go faster. Because I need to go faster to my end destination, and I'm willing to pay others to go slower so I can go faster. You know, so if you're a student, you don't mind, you can well, I would like to get paid, you know, for going slower, and other people drive ahead want to go faster. So these are all opportunities in the future which should be possible. You know, where you can actually decide what you want to do. You could also choose and say, well, I want to invite invest in the Tesla coin because you like the governance behind it. So this coin could be packed, for example, by solar panels, by wind farms generating electricity, and assets which align to your risk profile and to your values. You know, so you can choose in the future, you'll be able to choose which currencies you want to have in your wallet based on your values. Which values do you want to be reflected in your wallet, literally? Like the same way you can choose today, do you want US dollar, euro, pound, you know, which currency do you want in your wallet today? So all this is, is possible in the future. And you see what is interesting today, in order to come up with those ideas, you need to have engineers, you need to have technologists, you need to have fintech experts, you need to have super creative people, you know, who come up with new products and new services which don't exist yet. And then you have designers to make it look nice, you know, so that's why this uh, multifunctional and interdisciplinary courses are so relevant because there's so much possible in our world and the more creative we are, the more incredible products we can design. Another example here is about green investments. And I mentioned I'm Austrian. So this is a picture from our holiday. I was with my children in Austria this summer. And we were lying on this lake. And the lake, we went swimming there. The water was so clean, you could drink the water, literally. You know, and I thought, how beautiful is Austria? You know, the, the pure nature there. And I think, you know, we are often moving now to a state where access to fresh water and clean air becomes the most valid asset. You know, where it's not guaranteed, you know, that we're living in, 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 a, say, in a clean and a healthy environment anymore. And so more and more people want to invest with purpose. You know, we see millions and billions of investors wanting to invest in funds which invest in pur with purpose, you know, with ESG credentials. And the reason why is because we always say talent is everywhere, but opportunities are not. You know, so people want to focus on social, on governance, on, 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 and on uh, uh, the environment. And again, the, the term of DeFi, probably you've learned that, you know, already, or you've learned that, you know, in, in FinTech, it's about decentralized finance. It's a key term which makes those things also more and more possible and reduces costs 
and reduces time. And uh, so that's another case study. Let me go to the third one. This is about financial inclusion. And when I think about in the past, you know, when I talked about financial inclusion, I was thinking about Africa or about emerging markets. But we should not forget that this is a topic for the UK. It's a topic for us at home. Even here in the UK, we've got 4 million people who have got no bank accounts. It's incredible. You know, when you imagine we've got 4 million people in this country with no bank accounts. So where do they put the money? You know, it's under the mattress, I mean, we just don't know. We have got 40%, you know, have to choose between heat or eat. So 35 million are unbanked in the United States. And unbanked means no bank accounts. So 35 million people in the United States have no bank accounts. So it's not an emerging market problem, it's a global problem. Financial inclusion is not at all here yet. You know, so many people, in fact, it's 2 billion people globally are excluded from financial services. And being excluded has got enormous knock on effects. I mean, you all could not imagine a life without a bank account. You know, it's like our entry point into savings, into investing, into loans, uh, into insurance. So all these, uh, and this issue is really a global issue. And what the first step is, of course, to get an access to a bank account, you know, which is fairly priced and provides, also gives us education. So I, I remember when I was in Nairobi a few years ago before Corona, you know, we talked about this topic and we said, it, you know, access to financial services to come with financial literacy, because it's very important that people understand how and what to do with their money. And so how to spend it wisely, not to get into debt, you know, so financial literacy is such an important topic as well. And in this example, is it a great example of how you can use fintech for financial inclusion? I mean, the big example everybody knows is mobile money. You know, in Africa, in Pesa, which was the first way where people could pay with their mobile phone without having a bank account. This was the first way of using telecoms minutes, you know, via Vodafone, uh, which is a, was a huge success and continues to be a huge success. And this is an example of a farmer. So if you look at her, she's got a farm, she's got lots of livestock, but she's got no money to feed her cows. So without money to feed your animals, your farm won't make it. But you can't sell it because then she has not many left, she's just got a few. So what Finte can do now, you can tokenize livestock. And with tokenization, I mean that you can, you know, you can confirm those cows exist, and then you can use them as a collateral to get a microloan. And with this microloan, you can feed your animals because you also need access to money and you don't need a bank account. So FinTech Solutions offer you those tools where farmers in remote areas, you know, to have no bank close to them and who maybe don't even want to go into bank because they would feel they get discriminated against, they have got access to money using blockchain technologies this way. <coughs> so it's a very, very powerful uh, and important case study for the next you know, 10, 20 years. So now I want to talk a little bit about investments. You know, as you can imagine, all these case studies are really powerful because they're powerful. Lots of investors want to invest in companies who can solve these issues. And the nice thing, what you see here now, is you see from 2010 to 2022, you see the global fintech financing volumes over the last you know, 12 years. And the first chart shows you the percentage of activity in North America. So you can see in 2010, 69% of all financing was done in US fintech companies. Today, it's half. And that's a good thing because it means more money flows into European fintech companies, into Asian fintech companies. So it's much more money stays or it gets invested outside of the US. The same thing we can see here in the deal count. So we had three quarters of deals were invested into US fintech companies. 
Today, it's less than 50%. So more than half of all fintech companies get money outside of the US. So that's a very positive uh, trend because we see fintech becomes a global opportunity for everybody to work in the sector and for people to get access to funding for entrepreneurs to start their own fintech companies. However, what we have seen, unfortunately, in the last few months, are storms of the cloud. You know, we have seen an economic crisis. We're going through a recession at the moment. Uh, we have seen that some of those issues are homemade. So you know, we think about the, the mini budget uh, and the clouds emerging, but it's long term. We see inflation. Inflation is a big issue because we've not seen inflation for 40 years. And with inflation comes so much risk and so much where investors sitting on the sidelines. In the past, you know, investors were investing lots and continuously in startups. At the moment now, lots of investors think let's wait and see, you know, because they don't want to invest in the wrong startup. Will startups survive? Will they make it? So we see a huge change currently in investor behavior. And, uh, and one key thing, as I said, is inflation. So now I was reading today, apparently in September it was 14%. It's, it's more than 10%. It was, I think 14% we talked about. So it's incredible how it goes up. And you know, the inflation at a 40 year high has, of course, enormous knock on effects. So as you all know, across financial products, mortgage rates, savings, which is positive. So hopefully our savings accounts will give you more interest. But of course, loans will pay at much higher high interest rates. And when you look at the stock market year to date, you see Standard Poor went down by 20%, FTSE went down by 21%, and there are now ETFs out there which only invest in fintech companies. And the one, the most famous one, is the Global X fintech ETF, has gone down by 41%. You know, so just year to date. So we've seen lots of value being destroyed by this financial crisis, which we've seen on Robin Hood is a fintech company in the States, you know, almost halved year to date. So the economic crisis is ahead of us. Uh, however, it doesn't matter for you as students and for you being here because long-term fintech will survive and long-term the best fintech companies will survive. And the other thing, of course, is to say that the established companies, they're all inclusive those times now to update the technology side, to upgrade their, their, their digital stacks. So what we have seen is like banks, you know, as I said, I'm on the, on the board of the bank, to you know, be investing in technology more than they ever did. So all banks invest more in technology than they ever did. But where it's harder, it's harder for startups. So if you are after university, and I know we put lots of students, you know, virtually on the other group joining us. If you are a startup after university, you want to become a startup CEO, found your own business. At the moment, that's harder than it was half a year ago because it's harder to raise your first round because angel investors, you know, the whole VC community, it's difficult, more difficult at the moment, but it will change. And the reason why it will change uh, is. Uh, I'll come to that in a second, but just to show you the, the amount of funding declined. So you can see here that in the second quarter, the funding dropped by a third. So for 50 companies who depend on fundraising or venture capitalists, you know, they have a third less money available. And if you're an entrepreneur, money is oxygen. You know, without money, you can't grow your business, you can't scale up. So at the moment, we are in a difficult environment for fundraising startups and scale-ups. But as I said before, you know, even the, in the most hardest economic times, very, very well known startups have been founded. So you've got names here, Uber was launched in the last financial crisis, you know, Airbnb, Square, WhatsApp, Glassdoor. All these companies were launched in the last financial crisis. And the reason why of the crisis is a good time to start a business is because it's easier to get good employees. It's easier often to get things done under the radar. 
you know, because you can move ahead, you're, you're, you're bootstrapping, and uh, you can get things done often faster in a, in a more difficult environment because it's often cheaper you know, to buy in resources and, 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 and um, partner. And so that's I think, important to remember. And for investors, if you put yourself into investors' shoes, investors, they use the so-called core versus satellite asset allocation approach. And what this means is often in this core of their investment strategies, they invest in passive funds. So when I, when I think back to my Morgan Stanley days, you know, I was at Morgan Stanley for seven years in asset management, and we were an active fund manager. So our fund managers, our portfolio managers, they needed to outperform the index in order to survive. And this was the biggest thing which kept them up at night. You know, if you didn't outperform the index, at some stage you would have been replaced by an ETF, an exchange traded fund, a passive fund. But in order to justify your existence, you had to generate alpha, you know, outperformance over the index. So if you look at uh, most in asset allocation strategies, they've got passive at the center, low cost, diversified holdings, and then they've got actively managed um, asset classes around, could be active funds, could be hedge funds, private equity, or could be private investments in fintech companies. And, um, and I personally, I also invest, you know, I'm also an investor, so I invest in fintech companies myself. And that's the way I look at it, you know. So we always say never put all your eggs in one basket. Very important as an investor. So you should only invest money you can afford to lose. Uh, and you have to diversify. Because if you invest in 10 companies, you know, you don't know which one are the big winners and which ones won't make it. So you need to have a diversified strategy in place. And last but not least, it's the last page now. I also wanted to update you on our third film, which we're doing. So I mentioned already that we wrote, you know, seven books so far. And this is the new film, which is called Fintech for Good. And we are co-producing this film with ITN. It's our third film. Each year we're doing another one. So this year it's focused on Fintech for Good, which basically means Fintech with a purpose. You know, because we want to highlight those fintech companies who do good for society, who good do good for the environment, who have got good governance in place, and who really can reinvent our financial services sector in order to improve the lives of all of us, in order to give you know all students as well great opportunities for wonderful careers. Uh, so we that's our focus for this year. And we've started filming, and the film comes out in December. Uh, and then if you you can follow, if you follow you know, Fintech Circle or myself on, on LinkedIn or Twitter, we will announce the film. You can watch it, of course, on, online. You can learn more about the Fintech sector and the latest players. So that's all on my side. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> And I think we take Q and A after after that is spoken. Perfect. Okay, so then we go to that. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure. And of course, it's tough to go after Susan. <laughs> And uh, we have this all the time. Uh, for some reason, we are both invited to kind of same events all the time. <laughs> so we become friends. Um, but it's a pleasure to be here. And she's given a fantastic introduction on FinTech. So I thought I will talk about the topic that's close to my heart, which is really collaboration within FinTech. And it's very interesting. I, I'll talk a little bit about my background because you'll kind of see where I'm coming from. Uh, because I started my career in finance. Um, I, my first job was, was with a fund company called Goldman Sachs uh, as an analyst working for uh, probably about 18 hour days and as an equity salesperson. But um, out of interest, I started learning tech and programming. Um, so it's not something that, um, that I worked on really, it, it came out of interest, even though to be fair, um, the country I'm from in India, you kind of start learning programming at a very young age. 
I think I started learning programming at the age of 12 in school as part of the curriculum, which funnily enough, I don't see here with my son, who is also 12 now. Um, so strangely, um, it is built in into the DNA the of the curriculum of the academic part when I grew up, but I kind of took up tech as a career option later and I worked in companies like IBM and Ericsson and all of that. Um, when FinTech happened, and just exactly as Susan said, we worked in FinTech before FinTech had a name and that's what happened, kind of connecting the background in finance with my interest in tech and that's where it all started. Um, but I also want to kind of say um, that the collaboration angle, that really comes because I've worked in so many different companies. I worked in banks and I've worked in startups. I run a startup now. And of course I teach as well. So we're just mentioning that I teach the MSc FinTech course uh, at one of your competing universities. <laughs> so um, again, it's out of interest. And um, I helped design the course and curriculum there as well. So I believe that FinTech really does bring these kind of firms together. Um, and uh, one of the things that I always like to talk about is that widening ecosystem, not just banks and startups that we always talk about, but also bringing in government bodies and regulators and universities together uh, because everyone wants to make FinTech a big thing. And we are all here with the same aim. So I'm always looking at opportunities to do that. I was also part of the Brexit subcommittee um, on FinTech, which was very interesting because, again, the question really in front of the committee, the parliamentary committee was, how do we make sure FinTech remains a strong part of uh, job creation and uh, the driver of economy after Brexit? And it's been a very interesting conversation. I'm sure you know that you know, visas have opened up for FinTech, for example. And, a um, lot of job opportunities have been created by the government itself. And it all stemmed from that desire of the government to do this, to bring FinTech into the focus of industry. And same in Singapore as well. The reason Singapore is doing so well is, um, again, the government is interested. Anyway, I digress. Um, back to my topic, which is really about ecosystems within FinTech. And, um, and I think we'll take questions at the end. <clears throat> so why are we talking about collaboration and ecosystems now? I don't think we're talking about it more than ever, but certainly more in the last couple of years than ever before. Because um, I run a research company, so I will come across as a you know, very boring numbers oriented presentation today and I apologize for that. But uh, what we kind of define as fintech in my research company is any startup that launched after the economic crisis of 2008 as a way to disintermediate the financial system. So with that in mind, um, we know what fintech is and we talk about it all the time, but collaboration as a topic, ecosystem creation as a topic has come about um, as a hot topic only in the last couple of years. And there are several reasons for that. The fundamental reason is profitability. At the end of the day, that's what drives industry. We have seen a huge drop in fees, both in retail banking, corporate banking, and investment houses. We have seen a huge amount of um, focus shifting away to uh, digital products. And in a world with a lot of competition from fintechs, we also see a lot of um, banks have been talking about a digital strategy. Now, the interesting thing is that a lot of banks do talk about their digital strategies, but very few banks actually have a digital strategy in place today, which I find very interesting. And also, there's a lot of conversation within banks that have shifted from, oh, we want to do it all in-house and we want to build that project ourselves. We want to do all the transformation with our favorite vendors, you know, the top five consulting firms. But now the conversation is more around, we have a product, which is, could be payments or international payments. How do we work with the FinTech to be more profitable? How do we make sure we get the best fees or margins possible? So there is that, that conversation in the industry today is really stemming from the desire to be more profitable which is a good or bad thing, uh, depending on how you define. Um, and 
but the conversation is very much around what banks want to do with uh, fintechs at the end of the day. We did a research on what people are talking about, and this is from earlier this year, um, so 2022. I know it's hard to read, but it's interesting when you research fintech hashtags on Twitter. And I do that because I want to understand the sentiment in terms of what industry, professionals, bankers, startups, uh, mostly startups on Twitter to be fair, and investors are talking about. And it's not topics like payments or uh, AI or the cool things that we tend to hear about all the time. People tend to talk about things like central bank, reg tech, um, proxy voting or real-time document verification in North America. In Europe, it's mostly cool stuff like selfie-based onboarding and uh, data, I mean, of course, data privacy and reporting everywhere. Um, Africa is very much around new sandboxes being launched by the government and new central bank currencies. And in Asia, it's more diverse, but again, it's around KYC and uh, video verification, etc. And Australia, of course, they have a new, um, a lot of focus on VNPO, but they have a new um, rec tech regulation coming up around um, open banking. So a lot of conversation around that. So if you look at what FinTech is all about, it is not the cool B2C stuff that we tend to read about in the newspapers, or all of the B2C startups that we all know, and I'm sure we can name a few, but actually the trend that's driving us now is the B2B side, the less interesting side, very much around regulations and compliance and the increased need for security and privacy, which we never had before. Uh, it's only in the last five years that we've really started digging into technology use around security and privacy and consent. And of course, pandemic driven need for selfie based KYC and video based KYC and things like that. So the conversation very much today is around the B2B and the regulatory side, which we found quite shocking to be honest, because we didn't expect Twitter <laughs> to talk about regulations to be honest. Um, but it's a fascinating insight into what people are thinking about. And if you look at partnerships again, we looked at banks' partnerships. I mean, on the retail side, there's quite a few. Um, a lot of partnerships actually going on. <coughs> it's a slide that I've had for several years, and I said this year I'm going to make a new slide, but I want smaller numbers, <coughs> so I'm going to use corporate banking partnerships. So this is the corporate banking partnerships. We looked at all of the top 50 corporate banks um, globally, and we looked at how many banks have actually formed a partnership with a B2B fintech or a rec tech, um, anyone operating in that space. And of course, 2018 was one. And if anyone is interested, I'm happy to tell you which bank later. And then the moment we have come to 2022, year today, so that's half a year, we are at 10. So it's not a huge growth, but considering that the first partnership was made in 2018, it's quite interesting um, because it is growing steadily and we find that this has been kind of a pivotal year. And again, kind of driven by the pandemic digital transformation needs as well. We've gone from eight in the last, the previous two years to 25 um, in the recent two years. And again, um, where FinTech started from, and Susanna has spoken about it quite a lot, is FinTech has evolved in direct demand to what customer experience requirements are. And she gave the car story by Ford, which is fantastic. And uh, that reminds me of the Apple story as well, which is that um, no one knew they wanted an iPad. No one knew they wanted an iPhone until Apple actually launched them. Um, and the Barclays CEO said something similar. We need to think about what, not what customers are asking for, but we need to actually give them what they are not even thinking about today. So customer experience is the fundamental driver of FinTech and the industry we have here today. And again, if you think about the MSC FinTech course itself, which I've been teaching for about four years now, it's interesting there's such a course. We've always had, I mean, we are talking about a university system that's um, 500, 600 years old in the UK. 
we have introduced a new industry from masters in management and masters in finance, which is what we've had for a whole hundreds of years. We now have masters in fintech. So it kind of tells you the impact it's making on both the job market and in terms of academic research. But it all stems from that desire for both retail and corporate customer experience. And what does customer experience really mean? I mean, it encompasses a lot of things, but again, I really want to touch upon the boring side of customer experience, if I may say so, because enough people, I think, in the industry talk about the front end, the apps, the AI-based chatbots and things like that. I think what we really need is the ability to digitalize and automate some of the basic things in banking, which is where we are going now in the phase three of FinTech. Um, for example, how do we have um, how do we have automated sweeping of excess funds? Um, every at the end of the day, when you uh, uh, rationalize your uh, market instruments, then how do we do that automatically? How do we rationalize multiple bank accounts for corporates? Um, how do we run stress scenarios using AI? So it's actually the phase three of FinTech is not as exciting as the first two phases. Um, the first phase being 2008 plus and the second phase being 2016 plus. And the third phase is very much around the B2B side and the back end of a lot of the regular banking processes and how we can deal with that. The other trend that we kind of see um, in the market is a heavy, heavy focus on SMEs. Now that's also a third phase trend, purely because traditionally customers always get what they ask for. The first thing that changed with digitalization is retail, because customers are, I mean, they're supposed to be king, but um, banks love to deal with um, interesting end customers. The second thing that always gets um, digitalized is the corporate side, because corporate banks are also quite demanding, even though they come after retail purely because it's just so much to digitalize. But something in the middle always gets forgotten, which is the SME part, a small and medium business, uh, which is what, again, the, a lot of digitalization during the pandemic is <clears throat> happening in that space, kind of bridging the gap between retail and corporate. Um, in fact, if you look at SME lending and the, and the borrowing that we saw during the pandemic, um, 1.23 million SMEs were given loans. Um, and again, that's a huge industry in itself in terms of lending and um, the opportunities for technology within lending. Um, and 72% of UK SMEs actually saw an increase in that demand between March and August 2020 when the pandemic started. So SMEs have done well, and SME lending particularly have done extremely well um, during the pandemic. And I'm sure you're familiar with Starling Bank, for example, it's a challenger bank in the UK. It was profitable during the whole of the period of the pandemic, 2020, 2021, and purely because of the lending portfolio. So the marketplace and the lending companies within the marketplace was extremely um, well run <laughs> during that time. Um, again, partnership is huge in that sector. So, I mean, these are just some examples, but if you look at any bank on the retail or corporate or SME side um, in the world, you find examples of collaboration. Some of the examples are very much around customer facing um, sections. Some of IDBs is one of the best performing uh, small corporate bank in the world. Um, they have launched their own peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. Uh, TD Bank has done a lot of front-end changes around lending, um, dynamic discounting. So that every bank in the world is uh, collaborating with startups in terms of lending. The third trend that I kind of see, of course, is the other big sector within FinTech, which is payments. So again, payments is facing this big squeeze in terms of margins because the corporates have to reduce rates um, the corporate banks have to reduce rates to meet the, um, the competition kind of from fintechs and the smaller banks. And the, and the customers are actually searching more and uh, looking at alternatives before they can make them. So 
again, we move payments to a very cost effective infrastructure, for example, the cloud, and using a cohesive regulatory framework, for example, in Africa, most countries are not on real time payments at the moment, but the regulations are coming out about. I think there are 54 countries in the world going through that change at the moment. So a lot is happening on this side in terms of governments and infrastructure, um, along with our open APIs being pushed. So it's a very interesting time. I think regulations are catching up and definitely um, leading um, is, I would say, Europe, uh, where um, Africa and most countries in Asia are actually looking to learn from the UK and Europe. I hear um, from some of my committee members that they are looking at new regulations around GDPR as well, which are completely different or, or very significantly different from the actual GDPR, which is quite unfortunate, but it is a great opportunity to create um, some new regulations for the digital age, certainly. Like I said, you know, the revenue share um, of payments is now actually much higher for, um, I mean, it's much higher for um, corporate um, in some markets, uh, but in uh, North America and South America, it's actually the other way around. But corporate um, margins are now getting very interesting as a trend. Um, so Sam touched upon it. I think, again, when we talk about collaboration, embedded finance is one of the hot topics that everyone is talking about. And again, something to think about. Um, I've recently updated my course materials, adding embedded finance. So something to think about for your MSC Finter course. Um, and how does embedded finance actually work? So one of the great things about embedded finance and the reason why it's such a fantastic case study is that it brings all of the players in the ecosystem together. So we are talking about data players, uh, anyone who supplies data or uses data in that ecosystem. We are talking about startups um, supplying, for example, um, any kind of financial solutions. We are talking about any bank or financial institution who have created a new product. And we are talking about a platform that connects all of these together. So embedded finance to me is one of the best case studies of what I keep talking about, which is collaboration within the ecosystem, but with the help of a platform. And in the center of it all is a, is a platform that brings all the data to the relevant players um, in an effective way. And a great example of that is Uber. So if you look at Uber, Uber is no longer a car uh, transportation company. They actually supply a huge amount of loans to the drivers. They supply a huge amount of financial services. They're more like a bank now. Um, in that they provide loans, they provide payments facilities, they provide uh, invoice financing, cash flow management solutions. So Uber is the kind of turn into a mini bank without a license of sorts. Um, and what they do is um, they will allow the drivers to access their core bank features and products and services. And um, of course, the fintech um, can support any fintech can support it by offering a platform or an app or a data analytics um, capability through the same platform. And Shopify is another example where it allows merchants to connect to the bank's uh, capabilities with APIs as well. So again, these are fantastic examples and actually happening in a, in a highly scalable manner today which is very interesting as a topic. And uh, again, I don't have to push uh, embedded finance too much because I'm sure everyone is aware of how it's being used. The next trend, again, um, going back to what I said before, uh, the backend is now being developed, is the infrastructure. And some of the people investing the most in infrastructure are the big techs. So one of the interesting case studies I saw during the pandemic was when Google actually launched a new platform for community banks in the US. And they got six banks together and said, we will do the customer acquisition for you and you take care of the product creation. So it was very much uh, around the strengths of each business in that banks were um, asked to do the product origination and the um, 
uh, some of the pricing, of course, and uh, the regulatory frameworks. But then Google will take care of everything else from marketing to customer acquisition to managing of the, uh, the in-consumer wallets. It's a fantastic idea on paper. Um, I spoke about this at another event. And, uh, and then, I, I mean, on paper, it sounded like a fantastic idea. But what has happened since then um, is that it's, uh, three banks have left, left the partnership. So even though uh, technically, and I genuinely believe this is a model of the future, um, things are unfortunately didn't go well due to other reasons, which could be political, uh, which could be data sharing issues, data privacy issues, um, and several other things we can think about. But um, I think the future very much looks like that. There is a platform or an infrastructure built by someone who is very good at it. And the, you have customer facing people who are very good at it like Google or Amazon or uh, Apple or anyone who is very good at customer acquisition. And then the actual financial product itself is created and managed by a regulated entity like a bank. And I think that is the future for sure. And also one step further, uh, in future, the FinTech is probably very invisible. Uh, the FinTech is probably someone we don't really call a FinTech anymore because you will be telling someone, hey Siri, can you transfer some money to my, from my, to my best friend? And you wouldn't know who is actually making the transaction possible. It could be n number of startups, fintech startups, but we will not call them fintech because it's part of our daily life. It's part of our regular activity. Um, and I think that's where we are headed with activities that um, Google and Amazon are doing. Um, and, the, and one of the reasons why this is so important is the amount of data coming in from new sources. I, I had a car from a subscription company because no one will sell me a car because of my poor driving behavior. But um, one of the things that I found very interesting about the subscription car company, and please feel free to ask me for a reference, I get money from it. Um, and one of the great things that they do is that they actually have um, sensors fit, in, fitted into my car to monitor um, if I'm braking on time, if I'm driving properly within the speed limit and uh, cameras facing inside and outside the car. Um, I'm happy with that because um, you know, if I can prove that I can drive properly, then I actually get the car and the good uh, insurance on it. Um, so I think the amount of data, I mean, the car itself has so many computers in. Um, my car apparently has 52 computers inside of it and 20 of them in, on the screen. But um, the amount of data coming in through new methods, for example, automotive data or health apps, and most insurance companies now rely entirely on wearable data uh, for, your, for your blood pressure, or heart, heart rates, and things like that. So wearables, and there's a company I'm sure you're familiar with, in the UK called Vitality Insurance who um, give you a discount if you wear your wearable um, every day and you track 10,000 steps. So, I mean, wearables is a huge thing in terms of data provision into insurance and subsequently banking, automotive data as well. Websites, I mean, social media, I work for a bank, a top five bank, big bank in the world, um, that's using social media data to help customers make decisions when I say help, <laughs> you know, it, it guides customer behavior. Um, and it, it's again geolocation data, for example. So they combine your social media behavior with where you are. For example, you walk into a shop. Um, they know that you walked into Zara, you're going to spend 100 pounds. And they give you a warning or um, nudge kind of to say, you don't have 100 pounds in your bag account, so think about it. So um, that's already happening. So social media data gives you uh, additional information of the person itself, who you follow, what kind of words do you use, and all of this is analyzed using machine learning to kind of give those kind of guides. Um, web scraping, we know about those. Mobile phone usage, again, one of the most common type of data used by fintech apps is how you use your mobile phones, how you hold your mobile phone, how often do you have it fully charged? Is it always below 20% and in trouble? Are you always running out of battery? So you're a risky customer. 
almost every investment uh, management app, robo-advisor tracks that behavior, and which we probably don't see, but if they do. And also the bookmarks um, in terms of what kind of websites we like to visit, um, the other apps you have installed, all of this information is available. Um, so Findex apps do use some of that to provide um, financial-based decision making. So this kind of new data coming in and heavy, heavy volume and scale of data coming in is very unique um, right now in, from 2020 to 2021 um, in that we've started using it in banks in a big way. And that's going to change the ecosystem as well. Um, like I said, I mean, most of that is now on cloud. Um, when we talk about um, the, the usage of cloud, we find that most of the onboarding technologies are actually very popular to be on cloud. So things like biometric face mapping, passwordless authentication, e-signatures, all of them are extremely popular in terms of infrastructure investment. So to kind of summarize, why are we talking about ecosystem and platformification? I genuinely think um, platformification is absolutely essential for survival in the future, because we're talking about profit margins for recovering payments, which is almost zero, and which is decreasing every year, every month. We're talking about the big techs coming in and taking a big chunk of the customer facing side, the ownership of customer, which is previously very, very valuable for a bank, but no longer with the bank in terms of ownership. We're talking about the technologies itself, the AI, the data analytics that's coming in, all of them actually cater to better partnerships and more efficient partnerships, except the cultural part, which is a whole other equation. And of course, the customers continue to demand a better experience. So all of these are actually ripe in terms of asking for a better platformification. Um, but hopefully, um, we see everyone, including universities and regulatory bodies and academicians actually coming together to support the customer. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Baby and Suzanne. This is absolutely amazing. I think we've covered a huge amount of ground. I think in terms of the knowledge base that you've got, I think there's lots and lots of things. I've, I've taken lots of notes, as you can imagine. So I'm trying to sort of encapsulate the sort of the lecture, if you like, or the presentation that you've actually delivered in a few words. It's, it's really difficult. Um, so, what we are going to be doing now is opening up questions. If there's anyone who's got questions on on in, uh, on the matters that you've just Thank raised, you. so I can jump in quickly. Um, you mentioned about uh, the fintech innovations often come out of a crisis or a crisis situation. Have you seen anything interesting in the energy market current coming? in terms of helping families or individuals manage energy or energy payments or uh, so any any link to um, fintech in the energy sector take a second one so we can have one was it back? One, two, three. Yes, it does. Um, a great question. Super ready then. And, uh, and I must say, not yet. So I've not yet seen a fintech company focus on the retail customers as us. But I've seen a fintech companies focus on the credit market, on the on trading of, 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 of ESG credits. You know, I've seen even Tesla, for example. Tesla, as an example, makes more money, or at least last year, they made more money selling credits offsetting uh, CO2 than selling cars. Because they have the other car companies to offset their CO2s, they make more money selling those CO2 certificates than actually selling cars. You know, So in this case, I've seen it, but I've not seen it yet. Uh, but I hope fintech companies will focus on this area because it's a huge opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. 
So I, I think if I can actually lead on from there, because um, I had a similar question to Malcolm as well. We're currently in a financial crisis. The last fintech, but the label actually fintech, came up in 2000, 2008. And a lot of these developments were, as you said, under the radar. What do you think is happening now? We're in, a, in the midst of a financial crisis. Um, again, we base a lot of that based on what consumers are saying as well in terms of sentiment analysis. But to kind of address the point, the current crisis around energy, um, what we're seeing is a kind of decentralization happening and the, um, the vertical uh, disintegration, so to speak. What I mean by that is people are now focusing on their strengths uh, in terms of whether it's energy production versus its uh, infrastructure for renewable energy, versus billing, um, versus marketing and customer acquisition, I see a lot of disintegration happening, companies splitting in the space. I would not say tech is enabling a lot of that, but the industry is clearly changing. And once it disintegrates, then we'll be at the position where 2008 uh, banking was, which is the ability then to transform in a smaller way. So I think we're getting there, um, but we need to see much more disintegration before we will see that. Uh, in terms of the fintech uh, role of the current crisis, I would say no. I mean, there's been a heavy focus on ESG for the last couple of years, which has kind of come apart from the pandemic. Unfortunately, fintech, fintech is great, uh, but to be kind of a devil's advocate, I think they tend to focus more on where the next funding round comes from. Um, which is necessary for survival, not necessarily on what can I offer um, to improve the economy, um, sadly. But there are some who will focus on that, I'm sure. Um, and one of the things that we are beginning now to see is um, companies, for example, who provide budgetary capabilities in terms of visibility uh, for every spend that's going out of the bank account. Uh, the bank that I mentioned working on, they're trying to avoid debt traps by advising people on um, purchasing something before they actually purchase it. Uh, they are using social media based not just to invest more. Um, so there are some companies actually doing those kind of behavioral changes, but it will take time. Any behavior change takes more than six months. Okay, thank you. Okay. One more example. Okay. Uh, one more example to your question about the your question so in terms of startups who are focusing on this uh, area of ESG now, um, there's one company which is called Echo, so E-K-K-O, Echo, and it's an Echo app, so you can download an Echo app and you can pay with your Echo card. And what it does, it measures your carbon footprint. Because when you think about, you know, ideally you want to know what is your carbon footprint in order to find out if you are carbon obese. That's a new word, carbon obesity. You know? And we don't know, are we carbon obese or not? Because we often don't know what is our carbon footprint. And it's difficult, very few people would have an Excel spreadsheet and, and calculating, adding everything up. But having fintech solutions where you can use a credit a card, you know, Echo card in this case, everything you pay for, they calculate your points, your carbon footprint. And so you know by the end of the month, that's roughly how much you have spent and cost in terms of CO2. And then you can think about what you do with it, how do you offset, do you want to plant trees or what do you want to do, you know, to about it. So that's one example of a startup which I like, you know, which has been launched just recently. So there's a credit rating attached to carbon of these <laughs> it could be the rules in the future, exactly. <laughs> Are there any questions? Thank you. Um, could you say something about where uh, financial regulation and governance and things like anti-money laundering and all of that fits in? Because if you set up a, 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 an online business, it's very easy to promote it internationally. It's very easy to have a sort of donate or a pay mechanism. But all the stuff that sits behind it, the due diligence, the customer protection, all of that is very nationally based. So how does that work? And, 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 and where do you see that? Developing? 
Good point. I saw it because I had the OTA clinic. So it's um, it's I think it's a hugely hugely uh, important area. They do a very 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 um, important for all fifty companies because all fifty companies have to comply with the law if you onboard customers. And what we have seen is that you know KYC, anti money laundering. And normally, any fintech company who is client facing, if they don't take this seriously, you know, they will have to pay fines, so they will be out of business, so they have to stop, you know, operating. So there's no, there's no, there's no delay, you know, to get it right. And the regulator, they have run sandboxes, you know, where they try to help startups understanding their obligations and understanding what they need to do to learn. Uh, but in the sandbox, the way you're testing things. But so once you roll it out, you know, it has to be working perfectly. And, uh, and I think rightly so, you know, because consumers have to be protected. And, uh, and so it's it's something which I think all, and, and, but the nice thing about KVC AML is it's done now in an automated way. So it doesn't have to be done anymore. It doesn't take any more weeks, but it can be done within a day or within minutes, you know, online, on online apps. Yeah, I think uh, I split your question to sections. The first is, should customer facing organizations be regulated more? I agree. Yes. I think everybody in fintech wants more regulation for fintechs or anybody who's serious about it. No one wants to be in a situation where we have seen last year where they have collapsed and customers have actually um, you know, struggled because of that. Um, so most fintechs are actually asking for more regulation. And the first sec sector we would see that in is BNPO, buy not pay later. Uh, those regulations are coming soon to Europe and I'm sure to the UK as well. Um, and any other issue around customer consent, uh, we are, um, I'm fairly certain that regulations will come in. The other thing to remember, and that's the second part of the question, why is it local in nature? There are 450 regulations altogether affecting fintechs or financial services firms today. And 450 of them I think the most majority are in the US because of the federal and state acts and standards which are different from each other. Um, they have to be local at the end of the day. Uh, the California Privacy Act is completely different in the way it's defined compared to GDPR. Um, so most firms tend to take a specialty in terms of saying, I'm going to focus on MIFID II or I'm going to focus on California Privacy Act. And once that's established or done, then they move on to other similar areas because fintechs have limited resources, so that's how they work. So I do think being local is not a problem, and there are companies who provide platforms on a global regulatory point of view. One of my clients actually does that. Um, so they will bring in the rules as needed to avoid conflict between global and uh, local regulations. But I would not say that it's necessarily a thing. I don't know if it answers your question. Um, I'm interested to know like how, you know, you think like the kind of recent economic situation you know how like the fintech world navigates that so you know on the decentralization stuff obviously we've got a big inflation problem everyone's looking to central banks to manage that in like a decentralized finance world like i don't know how i wonder how that's managed and then you know stuff with like you know tether and you know the issues with collateralization and things like as you say with the buy now pay later stuff and this kind of shadow banking world that's emerged um, and we probably don't know where some of those kind of uh, delinquencies are going to end up and so just the sort of I guess like the, the the recent environment seems to have like shone a bit of a light on some of the issues that are potentially in the fintech world and I'm just wondering how you think they'll be navigated. Yes, very good points. I mean, I, I would say in terms of if you think about the cryptocurrency world now, you know, a few years ago, I mean, 2008, when Bitcoin was invented, for example, the Bitcoin, the currency is BTC, and the network is the Bitcoin network. Then Ether was invented. Ether is ETH, and the protocol is the Ethereum network. And then we have got out of those two, we have got now more than 20,000 cryptocurrencies. Can you imagine 20,000 cryptocurrencies and most likely 95% won't survive. You know, so we have got uh, maybe five, ten, which will really survive. So this was the first use case of the blockchain, you know, was developing cryptocurrencies and you could prove that it was possible to create 
a, a monetary tool, you know, a digital coin, and pay, receive money, and, and send this abroad. So this was the first use case. What you now, what people have now done is, for the first time lately, is that those blockchain networks in the past have been distinct. So I could send money or bitcoins to somebody else on Bitcoin, but I could not send my Bitcoin to somebody who's got an Ethereum wallet. You know, so there were no cross-chain transfers possible. Now that's again that's possible. But of course, opening up those possibilities comes with risks again, because we have seen, for example, crime, you know, criminal gangs, they're often a step ahead of us, and they then use this cross-border and cross-channel transfers to whitewash money, which they have gained, you know, in illegal activities. So, they, but they are, again, they are regulatory companies focused on cryptocurrencies, which is elliptic, as one example. They actually monitor those activities and they try to prevent, um, prevent that from happening. But I think what, what the key thing to think about is um, there are two worlds out there in reality. You know, one world is the one I grew up in, because I grew up in a world, you know, with no I mean, initiative. I was born, we had no mobile phones, you know, we had no mobile phones and we had no internet. And so I had to learn to use the internet, I had to learn to use the mobile phone, but I'm not, and I'm not a digital native, you know. Now my children have got two teenagers, they have been born in a world with internet, with mobile phones, they are digital natives. And on, on Monday and Tuesday this week, I was at a conference about Web 3.0, which is about the third stage of the Web. So the first Web 1 was about reading. This was a time we grew up, was initially was a, an internet, but we could read websites. The lots of websites, we could read the homepage, and that was it. The second part, Web 2.0, was when we started to share our own information, like Facebook. You know, we could have our own profile, we could write our own comments, we could share photos, that's Web 2.0. And Web 3.0, which is starting to happen now in front of our eyes, will be where we can read, we can share, but we can also own and make money out of our data. You know, so far, our data, which we contributed to on LinkedIn, on Facebook, was monetized by tech giants. They sold our data for advertising. In the future, on the Web 3.0, the goal is that we want to be able to monetize our own data and we are able to create and, and, and become a more creative economy where creators get incentivized for being part of the governance, to make decisions, and everything what we now know of financial services, we have a digital twin. So we call this a digital twin in the Web 3.0 world. And, uh, and, and at the moment, often, you know, when you talk to people, they're either or, they're either one word or the other, and they don't know about each other yet. But I, in the last few months, you know, I dig deeper in the Web 3 world, I'm so surprised how much intelligence, how much professionalism is there. And, uh, and still, it's like, it's almost like the, the, um, I remember Nokia, you know, when Nokia CEO was on Forbes on the first front page of Forbes magazine in 2006. And um, for 2008, it was a time when Apple's iPhone was being invented. And he was being asked about the iPhone. He said, and the, the journalist asked him, you know, do you think the iPhone is a competitive threat? He said, no way, you know, the iPhone doesn't work. It's, it's badly designed, you know, it's not a competitive threat for Nokia. And of course, we know Nokia always went out of business. Because the iPhone became the leader, and that's I think the stage we are in with financial services, where lots of existing financial services have got this Nokia moment, where in the back of their background, you know, these new Web3 competitors are emerging, but because they are working in different ways, they're not perfect yet, they're not regulated yet, so they're not fully launched yet, so they are overlooked. But once regulation is there, they fully launch ahead. Many of existing existing players won't be able to compete anymore because they're so far behind. You know, so it's a very interesting dynamic. Hi, I have two questions. One is related to the regulation, but not from the point of the view of the customer, but it's more uh, from the innovation. 
some points, as you mentioned, regulation move uh, slower than the, the innovation. But so, can we think that the, the regulation can kill the, the innovation in this in this area? And the second question is, what do you think about the international payment? At, the, at first, we have the the bank using SWIFT. Then appear wise that using like the peer to peer, we say like without doing the cross border. And now we have Web3 where we can do uh, international or cross border without uh, using the SWIFT or traditional band and uh, lower cost at some point, depending on the, how the, the gas fee is uh, during the blockchain. But so, what do you think? Do you think that the Web3 is going to be the future of the cross border payment, for example? Because in my case, I'm from Argentina. Um, I'm, my country, they, they're a super uh, adopter of uh, cryptocurrency to, to do international payment. Yes, very good. Okay, uh, so the first question can regulation kill innovation? Yes, it can, yeah. but it also can move innovation faster, both, you know? So regulation can have both roles. That's why regulators are very keen to get it right, because they don't want to kill innovation. Like our FCA, you know, our Bank of England, our regulators, PRA for banks, they are very careful not to over-regulate, because they want, like they said, they want the UK to be a global thinking hub. You know, they want the best fintech companies to be able to come here, work here, so they don't want to over-regulate uh, in order not to kill off innovation. And we have seen with examples such as MIFID 2, you know, with GDPR, we actually have seen innovation being triggered by regulation or by uh, latest payment, PSD2, you know, by payment innovation. Payment regulation is triggered then payment innovation in, in the fintech companies, so it can really go both ways. In terms of payments um, and payment rails moving away from SWIFT, um, definitely, you know, I've been at this biggest SWIFT, SWIFT conference, uh, which is called Cybers, which takes place once a year in Amsterdam, it was last week, and I've been there, all banks in the world, everybody's there, you know, and the global network so far is called SWIFT, where all payments in the world are being trans, tra uh, transferred on. But SWIFT itself is a consortium of the biggest banks in the world, all, all global banks in the world. They are innovating. You know, they are testing, they're piloting the blockchain. They want to use distributed ledger technology to send uh, money abroad. Uh, they are using artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, to prevent uh, artificial kind of. Um, let's say patterns, if there are patterns which would make you cautious that you're dealing with fraudulent payments, or you're dealing with um, illegal, illicit payments, you know, you can pick them up with AI, machine learning. And so SWIFT as an organization is testing all those things out. But of course, there's lots of private sector activity, which might move even faster. And when you think about Ukraine, you know, as, as uh, after it was attacked by Russia, uh, lots of Lots of countries and lots of um, individuals, and lots of associations in the digital currency space, they send money to Ukraine using cryptocurrencies because they could do this fast, quickly, and cheaply. So lots of people uh, in the Ukraine got digital uh, stable coins, you got money which they converted locally then to help them uh, mobilize. So that was you know one one. Um, huge opportunity where we could see, you know, where it worked. Equally, there was a concern, could you use to send money to Russia and circumvent the sanctions? And of course, you could do that as well. You know, you could circumvent the sanctions by using cryptocurrency, sending money to Russia. So it goes both ways. And, uh, and, and you know, that's, so both things are possible. It just depends, you know, do you want to use it for good or not? Yeah, I think um, I will just quickly add on to that, which is that uh, blockchain is definitely being tried for payments infrastructure. It's, I mean, uh, R3, for example, has been in existence for more than five, six years now. Um, I would ask ourselves that question, why is R3 not that successful? It had the backing of around 30 banks who all wanted to do payments over a blockchain, but people don't use it today. So again, on paper, it's a fantastic idea. But why is it actually not happening? 
Just one, one final question. Right there. Um, with um, public land deals where they are, and I guess the equivalent agreements where they are always there, is there a risk that private lenders are going to move away from lending FinTech? I, I do think so, yes. I think there is a risk, you know, because if with um, the, the risk is, you know, because as soon as the inflation has gone up, interest rates have gone up. So it becomes number one, if you are a fintech company and you want to take a loan, it becomes more expensive, you know, to lend money, number one. Number two, if you want to raise equity and your investors using discounted cash flow models, to value the value of your company long term, all of a sudden the variables have changed. You know, the input factors have gone up enormously. So your valuation might be much less than you thought it would be as a result. So there is a huge there is a huge impact and a, a knock-on effect, you know, on inflation, high interest rates, and on um, the inflationary environment on the Phoenix sector, I think some of those impacts we've not even seen yet. I think it's just at the beginning where everybody realizes what did it change and even in our personal lives you know where people many people are still on fixed mortgages you know, they have not seen yet what will happen once the mortgage expires you know and there are i don't know how many millions of households are forgotten in the uk still on a fixed rate you know but it expires in half a year and then the mortgage rate might double in size you know and how many can afford that so i think in terms of the impact of the fintech sector it's just the beginning um, we will see much more happening, but I could imagine that also maybe some fintech companies who want now to offer savings products would have again an opportunity to do something which couldn't have been done in the past because you couldn't offer an interest rates because it was so low, you know. And, and the good thing again is it's also for those people who want to retire in the next five or ten years. Because when you think about retirement, those people who retire in the last ten years at close to 0% interest rates, the annuities were like nothing. You know, you've got a very small pension for one, I think for 100,000 pounds, you know, your pension per year, if you would have saved 100,000 pounds, you know, as pension pots, by the time you retire, you would have gotten about 5,500 pounds per year in, in income, you know? So now this will go up significantly. So I think for people who come, who are retirement age in the next five, 10 years, it would be a good thing because our pensions would be much better than they would have been if interest rates would have stayed flat. You know, so all the winners and losers on both sides. Well, thank you very, very much indeed. Fascinating insight into FinTech. Thank you very much indeed, Christy and Debbie. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sparing the time and for preparing such an interesting presentation. Thank you. Jane. Thank you. Would you like to say a few words before we break for a drink? Uh, well, Malcolm and uh, University of Westminster speakers, thank you very much indeed. Um, since uh, we were here last time, we have the installation of uh, all the splendid yes. uh, portrait from Hannah Gillingham. Um, so yet another sort of um, recognition of her contribution to university. And uh, this uh, series of lectures is, is transpiring to be a really uh, treasured annual event. So I trust we'll continue with that and um, uh, work to um, basically uh, continue all this uh, ambition to spread uh, interest in what uh, to many people seems a rather arcane area of life of financial system particularly pensions which of course uh, working with us today uh, yeah, her phone will be ringing off the hook um, in, in requests for advice of what to do uh, with the enormous problems that that industry is now facing. So, Malcolm, thank you very much. Thank you to the uh, Vice Chancellor for allowing this event to continue. And thank you for keeping all this legacy uh, very alive and kicking. Thank you. And thank you also in return for your support for the, the 125 Fund. There's a little more information about the fund in the Chilton Hall when we break. And there's the video on 29 Marylebone Road if you're interested in what we're proposing there. But thank you all for coming. Thank you for 
to the family and uh, for supporting the event and also for our students and for our business visitors as well. And again, thank you once again for your, your uh, support and fantastic presentation. So we have some drinks and we have some food if you have time to stay. I do understand it's getting late and there's no obligation to stand around awkwardly um, to, to be polite if you need to get off. That's no problem at all. It leaves more food for us. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are, if you do have time for a quick sandwich uh, and a drink, that will be wonderful to see. Thank you, Jordan. Anything further? That's okay. Good time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So we'll see. Uh, literally, just the rubber on the side of the corridor. Thank you.